All right. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, so it's a real joy to get to welcome you here from the Carney Institute. I'm Chris Moore. I'm the Associate Director. Um, and welcome to Mind Brain Research Day, although it's already been in full swing in the poster session. Um, maybe just one and a half sentences about Kearney. Uh, so the goal of the Kearney Institute is to help everybody here make great discoveries that then have some wonderful impact on the world. Um, and days like today are simply perfect for that. There's a lot of evidence that says collaboration across different kinds of, different kinds of every kind of boundary, but certainly across different kinds of science is one of the few things you can do to ensure you're going to have impactful work and well-cited work if you care about things like that. You want to, you want to change the world. Um, and days like today when you can, it was like being in a candy shop to get to walk and go to an absolutely brilliant poster about spinal cord stimulation leading to perception, turn around and then there's another brilliant poster using hierarchical temporal models to explain the recognition of tactile objects. Now there's one that was biophysically recording these ectopic spikes. I now understand that ADHD is fully understood and we can just regress to it. It, it, was, just, it was just a wonderful day. Um, one of our jobs in Kearney is trying to understand and try and do whatever we can to make that discovery environment better. So we've actually, to some extent, run the numbers on this and we've done things like try to understand how collaborative is the brown uh, brain science research community versus some other places that won't be named, but they're awfully wonderful places. And I can tell you quantitatively as a scientist, Brown is twofold more collaborative in the likelihood of shared papers and grants and interactions than really wonderful other places that are very similar and that you'd be very proud to think of yourself as more collaborative than. Um, and that's really neat. We even, we even to some extent, although not as much as we should, we were just talking about that, transcend the water cooler effect of people collaborating not just because they're on the same hallway, but actually collaborating because they're near enough and interact enough, which is great. Very few places escape that. Um, and actually, I remember when I was first considering coming to Brown and I was talking and I got this phone call from a Dr. Steve Rasmussen and he was like, oh, it's the best place. It's so collaborative. There's most wonderful science. And I'm like, absolutely true. It was a wonderful, I mean, it's, it's only grown in that uh, under Steve's wonderful leadership in psychiatry to a place that just has fabulous research. Um, so, yes, welcome. This is a great day. Enjoy it. I hope everyone got the enjoyment out of the posters, and uh, we're really looking forward to the talk. So I'll, I will now introduce Dr. Audra Tirka, uh, the chair of psychiatry, and take it from there. Thanks so much, Chris. Well, as the brand new chair of psychiatry and human behavior, it's my pleasure as well to welcome everybody and also to really extend our gratitude to everyone who helped make this day possible, uh, to Fatima Alves and Holly Wilker and Katie Leesner, Josh Spicer and Kristen Webster. Um, it's really a remarkable event. This event, this annual event, started in 1996, nearly 30 years ago in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior. And our immediate past chair, Dr. Rasmussen, then expanded it to collaborate with Kearney and with the Norman Prince Neuroscience Institute and the uh, brain-related departments and faculty and trainees and, and students uh, who are all uh, here today. So uh, I want to just take a moment to thank Dr. Rasmussen for his uh, incredible work. Our department has grown and succeeded tremendously under his leadership, uh, as evidenced by this wonderful uh, day and his, his collaborative uh, translational science approach. Uh, and I want to also mention that we will be having a celebration for him uh, in late May. Late May uh, to, details to be announced, so please keep an eye out for that. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Rasmussen, who will introduce our esteemed speaker. Well, I'll thank everybody for attending. And it's now my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Wayne Goodman. Uh, Dr. Goodman and I go back quite a ways. Uh, we both completed our psychiatric residencies on the neuroscience research unit at Yale in the 1980s, although I uh, will claim that I am senior to him in that regard. We've been collaborators, competitors, and friends for the past 40 years 
both working to improve the lives of patients with obsessive compulsive disorder. So following uh, uh, residency, uh, Wayne was still at Yale when I went to the Northeast Kingdom in Vermont, where I was the only uh, psychiatrist there in the Northeast quarter of the state. Oops, <laughs> sorry about that, Wayne. <laughs> uh, and back then, you, you know, OCD was thought to be a uh, neurotic illness and without a biologic etiology. Uh, that's how we were trained as, uh, as residents. Uh, and um, when I was in the Northeast Kingdom, I uh, started seeing lots of OCD patients as a primary care psychiatrist, one of whom happened to be a border guard in Derby Line, Vermont. Uh, and uh, that border guard had a great response to clomipramine, which was unavailable in the U.S. at that time, but he just went across the border and got it. And uh, by the way, he was a checker, and you did not want to have him check your car going through customs because <laughs> you would be there a long time. Uh, but after he took the drug, it was better. He turned out to be the East Coast conduit for uh, clomipramine for the next, uh, you know, uh, uh, several years before clomipramine became available. So after I got here to Brown, I began gathering a cohort of OCD patients and uh, went back to Yale where they were doing studies of noradrenergic uh, and serotonergic function in anxiety disorders. And that's where I uh, had the opportunity to um, meet Wayne. Uh, I take five patients on a Saturday morning and drive down to New Haven, uh, and I learned a lot about OCD in those drives. Uh, first, uh, prepare to be late, uh, no matter what, because there are, someone's going to be checking or someone's going to be washing their hands, uh, and we always left late. Uh, second, these patients had never met anyone else with OCD at that point, and it was a remarkable experience. They have five of them in the car talking with someone who else who had their symptoms. Uh, third, uh, when you got a speeding ticket as you entered Connecticut, you know, that New London speed trap, uh, all the patients would say, it's my fault, uh, because they were talking the whole time. Uh, and fourth, these patients wanted more than anything else to help others with OCD by participating in the research. Um, so uh, shortly after Wayne uh, began his career, uh, he put some of his patients on 2020. And uh, I don't know if he's going to tell the story, but uh, so many patients started calling after that of, oh my God, someone has this and there's a treatment for it. And uh, that really changed uh, how I think the public began to look at OCD. And Wayne was responsible for that. So in spite of occasional slips, like trying to rename the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale, the Y box, the fly box, when he was chair at Florida. <laughs> Dr. Goodman has gone on to have a stellar career. The author of over 100, 360 peer-reviewed publications, chief of the translational psychiatry branch at the NIMH, and chair of psychiatry at Florida, Mount Sinai, and now Baylor. His work has transformed how the uh, field and the public views obsessive compulsive disorder, as well as neuromodulation for psychiatric disorders. So his talk this afternoon will focus on deep brain stimulation for intractable OCD. Please welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Goodman. Steve made me tear up, so I'm, uh, excuse me. So I'm very thankful, very grat uh, grateful to you, Steve, and everyone else uh, for inviting me to give the uh, presentation today. I'm uh, really honored, especially when I look at the distinguished list of speakers who preceded me. So again, thank you for having me here today. I'm going to take my coat off because I, I perspire a lot. So uh, I've always wanted to use the expression carrying uh, coals to Newcastle. So this, this is a good opportunity for it, uh, talking about deep brain stimulation for OCD, because really the, many of the pioneers in this field are here at Brown. or uh, Some are not right here at this moment, but certainly Steve and Ben Greenberg 
and, and others, and others uh, not only in DBS, but in terms of neurosurgical approaches, Nicole and, and others, uh, well, who's doing uh, great work uh, also in, in, uh, as the neurosurgeon, uh, the uh, functional neurosurgeon here. So, uh, and I'll mention along the way, uh, you know, how we've collaborated and come together on some of the uh, accomplishments and some of the research that I'll describe. Here are my disclosures. Okay, for, for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with OCD, uh, I'll just, uh, just give you a little overview. It's classified in the current Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, among a group of obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders. It used to be called an anxiety disorder. Uh, I still think of it as an anxiety disorder, but now it's grouped with these other conditions, including body dysmorphic disorder, hoarding disorder, trichotillomania. Uh, lifetime prevalence is, is somewhere between 2 and 3 percent, and that's worldwide. Uh, it's been looked at in, in different cultures. It may have different manifestations in different cultures, but the prevalence is about the same. The majority of patients uh, have onset in childhood or early adulthood. Uh, when, when I see somebody who uh, looks like they had first manifestations of OCD, say in their 50s, start thinking about a different etiology. And there's lots of literature on accident, so-called accidents of nature, trauma, uh, uh, toxins that could produce uh, encephalitis that can produce obsessive compulsive symptoms that on the surface are indistinguishable from what we see uh, in the idiopathic variety. One of the distinguishing features of OCD between it and psychotic disorders like schizophrenia is no matter how bizarre some of the ideation and behaviors can be, the patients with OCD have insight into it. And, and because they have insight to it, insight into the, uh, how odd some of their behaviors may seem, uh, they may do a really good job of camouflaging their symptoms uh, from their uh, tr uh, providers and, and from their family. I had one patient who kept it from his wife for 20 years. Uh, and he would, uh, he would secretly incorporate his rituals into uh, other routines so that she never noticed. And uh, turning to treatment, there, there are two well-established treatment modalities. Uh, there's the serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Steve talked about clomipramine, which was, is a tricyclic antidepressant but a potent serotonin reuptake inhibitor. That was the first drug uh, uh, that le uh, wasn't the first drug ever tested, but it was the uh, first drug approved by the FDA for the treatment of OCD. Since then, there have been the uh, uh, ev evolution of the serotonin reup se selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and they've also most of them have been approved by the FDA. An interesting fact, and this is what captured a lot of our, our early research, probably the first 10 years of my, my research, uh, was that not only did the uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors work for OCD, they were, worked better than other antidepressants that were not serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So that, that's a big difference between the treatment of depression where, although there are individual differences, um, you can't say that about the treatment of depression. So that led uh, others and, and, and us in the field uh, start looking for a role of serotonin in the etiology or pathophysiology of OCD. And that led to uh, countless numbers of negative <laughs> studies uh, uh, in trying to probe it. And to this day still, uh, it's hard to find any direct evidence for a serotonergic defect. That said, that's one of the reasons, and I'll, I'll say that in a moment, uh, at some point I pivoted to devices, uh, uh, and, but it's not the only reason. The other uh, therapy that, that has been proven effective and often considered the first-line treatment, particularly in, in younger patients with OCD, is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy called exposure and response prevention. And they're highly effective, and if you, you look at the published literature, it looks like the effect sizes are greater for ERP. Um, I think, uh, though, it, you know, it's very hard to compare even some of the studies that did direct comparisons. And there are uh, many patients, uh, I mean, most patients do do very well with ERP, but there are patients uh, who do not tolerate uh, behavior therapy, exposure response uh, therapy, because in order to, for the therapy to work, they have to encounter the triggers that make them more anxious. And for some patients, they don't habituate. 
and uh, they just feel more anxious, and so they don't tolerate. In much the same way, if you think about pharmacological treatments, there are some patients that are just not going to tolerate the drug. So there are some patients that won't tolerate the exposure response prevention, or they, ha they have a partial response. So a lot of times, although the literature is a little fuzzy on this, but in clinical practice, we, we often are using both exposure response pre prevention therapy and medications. Turning to treatment resistant OCD, so uh, not long after you know, doing, I was involved with trials with clomipramine and the SSRIs and trying to demonstrate the, that they were more effective than other antidepressants, uh, start to realize that uh, as, as good as they were, as effective as they were, there were a subset of patients that didn't respond. Uh, and well, along the way, uh, came up with a, an approach of using low-dose uh, adjunctive antipsychotics for patients who had a partial response uh, to an SSRI or a clomipramine. And then what we, we, we were able to show in a study that was funded by NIMH is that was particularly effective in those OCD patients who had a lifetime history of Tourette syndrome. And as, as you may know, the antipsychotics are a medication. They're dop not all, but most are dopamine antagonists, and they, they help to suppress tics. But in the case of uh, the studies that, we, well, that have been published, uh, in adding antipsychotics to serotonin reuptake inhibitors in OCD, they also work on the OCD uh, in those cases. Not all, and it's not restricted to those patients that have tics, although if you have a patient that has tics and OCD, they're more likely to respond to that addition. Now I'm going to, I'm going to jump. Uh, in terms of there are other medications uh, that may be effective, lots of medications, particularly glutamatergic medications that are acting on the glutamatergic system that are under active study for the treatment of OCD, some used as monotherapy, some as adjunctives. Uh, so, but I'm going to skip all that because my, my focus is going to be on deep brain stimulation. Also have to mention uh, another device that's been approved for the treatment of OCD by the FDA, which is a, a form of transcranial magnetic stimulation called DTMS. So where do we stand with, uh, and, and I'm gonna, there are different targets, brain targets, anatomic targets for using DBS in treating uh, treatment resistant OCD. Um, but the, the, the one that I've had the most, actually the only experience with, I should say, uh, is the targeting the ventral capsule ventral striatum. Uh, and it also is uh, cleared by the FDA under a special category called the humanitarian device exemption. I'll say more about that a little bit later. And in a recent meta-analysis that, that our group published looking at over 240 cases worldwide, including different uh, anatomic targets, the overall response rate was about 66%. Uh, Lately, we've been doing a little bit better at our center, uh, closer to 80%, but it's not 100%. And for most of those patients that are even responders, it's, it's, it's not a, a, you're, you're not getting, a, we'll talk more about the Y box. You don't get a Y box of zero. That's, that's rare. So uh, getting remission is always a goal, uh, but sometimes it's not achievable or realistic. So there, there's room for improvement, I would say, in, in both the clinical be benefits of DBS for OCD. And there's also an uh, important behavioral side effect of DBS targeting the ventral capsule ventral striatum, and that's the induction of hypomania and even mania, including in patients that have no history of either. Uh, and when I tell patients, so I'm screening a patient who may be a candidate for DBS, and I tell them, well, there is a side effect we have to worry about, I may make you too happy. They say, oh, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> Because like 80% of the patients that we see have significant comorbid depression. So you can imagine if you have life-impairing OCD uh, for years and years, and to be a candidate for DBS has to be at least five years, uh, imagine that you, you, it's, not, it's understandable why you might develop secondary depression because of the tremendous impact it has on your functioning. So I'm going to say just a little bit about the Y box, and I, uh, I, I forgot about the fly box. I, maybe I'll go back to that, but I'm not Florida anymore, so forget it. So uh, although I'm credited as the principal developer, there would be no Y box without Steve Rasmussen and Larry Price. Uh, the three of us worked tirelessly on it, and I think uh, 
if Larry wasn't there, Steve and I would still be working on it 35 years later. <laughs> and the reason I say this, and this may come as a surprise to you, Steve is very obsessional. I'm very obsessional too. And Larry isn't. And so Larry was able to move us along. And, and that's how, I, I think, uh, enabled us to uh, accomplish the, uh, developing this scale, which is now the, which has been uh, and continues to be the worldwide tool for assessing uh, uh, clinical outcomes. It's approved by the FDA for, as the outcome measure, whether you're, no, no matter what uh, intervention you're using, uh, you know, whether it's psychotherapy, drugs, or, or devices, uh, folks use the uh, Y box as the outcome measure. I'm not going to go into the construction of the scale, but you do need to understand something about the scoring because I'll be showing some clinical outcomes. Uh, its, ra the, its range of the scale is from 0 to 40, 0 being no symptoms, 40 being extreme. And when we talk about a responder based on the Y box, use either a 25% or 35% reduction. Uh, in patients that have more severe OCD at baseline, uh, the preferred uh, uh, responder criterion is 35%. So when I talk about the DBS trials, it, I'm, not, I'm going to call a responder somebody had more than a 35% improvement. Uh, I'm not going to go into much detail about this, but I just wanted to mention that we, 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 we uh, uh, and Eric Storch is another kind of Larry Price-like person who uh, help, helped get us uh, moving and making a revision of the scale into the Y box 2. And one of the main reasons we, we developed uh, this version of the scale is because we want to be more sensitive to the upper end, particularly for our DBS trials. And you can see that in, in, in this. This is a, from a paper we published comparing the Y box 2 to the Y box 1. Uh, in the Y box 2, the top score is a 50. This person came as a 48 or a 39 on the 1. And you can see that they showed some improvement with uh, DBS uh, for the first three months that was only detected by the Y box 2 but the Y box one was insensitive to it, so that that so in, in our study and, and there's, it's pretty easy to convert from one to the other, so uh, and well, I'll show you both the Y box one and the two. So talking about uh, uh, th this was uh, uh, printed out by one of my patients back at Yale. You can see I, I still had a mustache then, uh, and uh, I, I, I love showing this. You did a great job on it. Um, so uh, the other thing, and I, I think I've uh, kind of alluded to this already, is uh, at some point uh, I, I pivoted from focusing, and so is the field, not just me, uh, on looking at uh, the, the role of neurotransmitters like serotonin. Or, and this do, not that there isn't good work to be had by saying looking at the glutamatergic system, but there's been a focus in OCD as well as, in, in, as, well as for other psychiatric disorders to look at them more as neurocircuit disorders. Uh, and um, that, that has really uh, influenced my approach, particularly for the use of devices. And in the case of OCD, and again, I'm not going to show you these data. Some of the data are old, but I think they, they've stood the test of time. That functional neuroimaging studies, whether fMRI or uh, positron emission tomography, uh, have generally shown uh, in the symptomatic state uh, increased activity of certain areas of the brain, particularly orbital frontal cortex, uh, chordate nucleus, or areas of the or, uh, cortex as well as the uh, uh, basal ganglia. And, and very interesting, uh, following treatment, successful treatment, effective treatment, whether it's with uh, a behavioral intervention or with medications, uh, the, those studies have shown uh, normalization of that brain activity. So that was some uh, clue to the, 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 the role of uh, different regions uh, that might be involved in OCD. But starting about 25 years ago, uh, there were also uh, circuit models that were developed. So not looking at a, just a single region, but looking at the entire circuit. Uh, that uh, and, and we refer to this as the cortical striatal thalamal cortical loop. Uh, it's a mouthful. The CSTC. Uh, and one of the nice things about having this model, it's, it's more of a heuristic. I, I wouldn't say that it's fully established. I mean, we, we, we all kind of believe in it as a, as a construct. Uh, and it's very uh, useful in terms of thinking about and testing hypotheses. So I think that's really its main value now, rather than looking at it as gospel. And here, and, and I, I'm probably going to butcher this, because uh, so, uh, but uh, here's just a simplified 
m model of, of the uh, circuit model of OCD. Uh, again, p point to Scott Rausch, who uh, wrote about this uh, almost 25 years ago. Uh, and there, uh, if those of you who work in the movement disorders field will, will find this very familiar in terms of direct or indirect pathways that involve the cortex striatum uh, uh, and thalamus back to the cortex. Uh, and there's a direct pathway, which is net excitatory and tends to facilitate behavior, whereas the indirect pathway is net inhibitory and tends to restrain uh, behavior. And the hypothesis is, is that in, in OCD, there's an imbalance between the direct and indirect pathways with an increase in activation of the direct pathway. And uh, f f further represented here is, uh, so the glutamatergic projections were, that are excitatory from the cortex to the striatum, there's increase in, in, in activity of that projection, which in turn uh, increases the activity of the striatum, but the output of the striatum is GABAergic or inhibitory, and that uh, inhibits the uh, substantia nigra GPI, which in turn leads to disinhibition of the thalamus that leads to increase in uh, 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 excitatory projections to the cortex. So what you have here, what you have here is a positive feedback loop. That's really what this is representing. I wouldn't go so far as to say, well, we've identified that obsessions are coming from the cortex, and that's the seed of the problem, or that there's a problem uh, somewhere else in the circuit. I think it's just, an, again, an interesting way of trying to conceptualize it. If you want to read more, uh, uh, there's a paper that I published together with uh, Eric Storch and Samir Sheth uh, in 2021 uh, where uh, we talk a little bit more about the circuit model and also uh, one of the issues that's come up and I've really had a great time meeting with folks uh, during my visit here um, is um, what's the connection if, between our treatments and our knowledge about the pathophysiology and neurobiology of OCD. So in this paper, what we tried to do is talk about the various treatments and try to see if we could link them to something we understand about the neurobiology. Uh, I'm not sure we were that successful, but there, there is a disconnect. And I go, go back to the uh, role of serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So how, how is it that serotonin reuptake inhibitors are preferentially effective in OCD, but we can't find anything wrong with serotonergic functioning. Uh, so, and, and that maybe is even misled. It's, maybe it's that they're, they're acting not on the pathology, but they're uh, producing some compensatory effect uh, that improves the symptoms of OCD and not a direct effect on the underlying uh, uh, underpinnings of the disorder. In terms of the different forms of neuromodulation, there, I just divide them up into surgical or non-surgical. Uh, I'll be talking about deep brain stimulation. Non-surgical listed here. I mentioned just a touch about uh, deep TMS being uh, uh, effective in OCD. Uh, and uh, I've been doing work, and I know you guys have been doing a lot of work on low-intensity focused ultrasound. That's a, a very exciting frontier uh, because it... Um, it has the potential to be, and this is a kind of an oxymoron, non-invasive DBS. So it's non-invasive, but you can uh, reach some of the deep structures that you can with DBS with a very focal field. So it, the potential is tremendous. We, we still, you know, we're still in the early innings, I think, of, 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 uh, of testing it out. I, I currently, uh, along with Darren Doherty at MGH, have a a funded study to look at LIFU in OCD, but I, I won't be talking about that today. So how, how do we get to uh, neurosurgical interventions for OCD? And there, there are several factors at play. Uh, one is the gravity of the illness. I, I mean, um, Steve kind of alluded to it in that one case, but the, the patients we see, and I, I forgot to show, in that very, very first slide, I, I showed you an artist's conception of Howard Hughes. I forgot to tell you why. How are used probably, by all accounts, had OCD. I don't think ever treated for it or have it diagnosed. Uh, but he would go through periods, like our own patients, uh, although he had con contamination concerns with germs, uh, he, he couldn't even take a shower because the rituals themselves became so onerous and time-consuming. Uh, but despite that, his executive functioning was com completely preserved. 
And if you ever see the movie The Aviator, you see a really nice depiction of that, of how he was collecting his urine in bottles, he was disheveled, but then he had to appear before Congress, he pulled it together, and if you look at that video, you wouldn't have any idea that there was anything wrong with him. All right, back to the slide. Um, and there, there, there's also, um, there, there are lots of, of, of published case series in the literature uh, of uh, ablative approaches uh, that are effective, uh, were effective, continue to be effective for the treatment of OCD. Uh, and so the, uh, I remember when I was at Yale, I had patients, uh, uh, we, didn't have, we, we weren't doing DBS at that time, but certainly patients uh, who I sent for ablation, and we still do. Uh, at Baylor and, I, and, you, and you still do here at Brown. In the case of a deep brain stimulation, uh, the, the rationale for using it uh, was that a DBS would be like functional ablation because it's delivered at a high frequency, somewhere between 100 and 150 hertz. So the, the, the notion is, well, that's going to, you're not going to be able to propagate uh, an action potential across a synapse at that kind of frequency. Uh, so that, that was the idea. It's, it turned out to be a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, and the targets, uh, for the most part, at least the ventral capsule ventral striatum target, uh, was really uh, selected uh, based upon the experience of neurosurgical ablative interventions. So this notion of following the lesion. So uh, and again, uh, talking about uh, calls to Newcastle. Uh, the, the, here below is a, a, a citation from uh, from a group at Brown, uh, S Steve and uh, Ben and Nicole uh, uh, on the, their work with uh, a ventral capsule, uh, a gamma ventral capsule lotomy in treatment resistant OCD. And so that the, the two uh, uh, ablations, and, may, and maybe there are more uh, 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 that are going on, but I think most of it today is uh, somewhere in the vicinity uh, of the in, uh, anterior limb of the internal capsule uh, or uh, ventral, striatum, ventral capsule ventral striatum. While I was at the uh, University of Florida, uh, uh, this paper came out. This was from a group in Belgium. I hadn't known at the time that actually Steve was collaborating with them. Uh, the, the, and they performed deep brain stimulation uh, targeting the anterior limb of the internal capsule in four patients with severe refractory OCD. And three of those four patients showed improvement. They also did follow-up studies that showed that those, those improvements lasted. So I said, well, I've got a lot of patients with treatment-resistant OCD. And, uh, successfully applied for a small grant from the NIMH, and then uh, Steve, Ben, and I uh, collaborated a lot uh, on making sure you know that we had a lot to learn from you guys in terms of uh, targeting and assessment. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the the results of that small study in a moment. Turn to DBS, and I, I know there are experts in the room, but for those of you who are not experts in deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation has full FDA approval for essential tremor, refractory Parkinson's disease, and refractory epilepsy. And then, as I mentioned before, there's this special category of humanitarian device exemption, HDE, uh, for, and uh, the criteria below uh, has to be fewer than 8,000 patients or candidates, uh, and uh, uh, the FDA is deemed that this probable uh, Benefit. There hasn't been the pivotal studies to, to, uh, to really demonstrate, but there was enough there for the FDA to get, grant this designation. And it's been given for dystonia and OCD, and so that OCD is the only psychiatric disorder with an FDA indication for a neurosurgical intervention. Um, and the, the, the HDA came uh, uh, about uh, based on an initial sample of 26 patients, and this is a paper that was uh, published by Ben Greenberg showing the different sites and included data from our University of Florida site. So uh, what kind of patients would we consider for DBS? Uh, first, they have to be an adult. They have to be at least 18 years old, uh, had to have OCD for at least five years. Uh, severe symptoms uh, is measured by the Y box of at least 28 uh, most patients are in the third, have scores in the 30s. They have to have at least three adequate trials of serotonin reuptake inhibitors, including clomipramine. Had to have had 
and failed augmentation with uh, antipsychotics, and importantly, had to have an adequate trial of exposure response prevention. So at, at this point, I always say it's very important. Any group that I've spoken to who, who thinks that they want to get uh, start doing CBS for OCD, I emphasize the importance of an uh, interdisciplinary team. So you need, obviously you need the neurosurgeon, but you need the, neuropsych- the psychiatrist, and you need the psychologist. Uh, uh, because we, we, I make sure that our psychologist is comfortable that this person has had an adequate trial of ERP before we, we consider them a candidate. So this is just a, a diagram. This would be a patient that's uh, getting DBS uh, targeting the STN for Parkinson's disease. Uh, the hardware includes this uh, uh, implantable pulse generator that uh, some people call a brain pacemaker. I don't know if I like that term, uh, but it's a little bit like a cardiac pacemaker. Uh, there's a wire tunneled under the skin that's connected to the leads that are implanted in the brain through a burr hole. Here we're just showing unilateral. In all our patients with OCD, the implantation is bilateral. And this is... Uh, uh, example of a lead there. I'll show you some uh, newer leads that are out there. Uh, there's a, qu- a quadrupolar lead. There's four different contacts. And where do I come in in all this? So I, I actually go to all the cases in the OR. They don't let me do the surgery. Good, good. good. Uh, that's an important lesson we learned back in the days of lobotomy. You don't let the psychiatrist do the surgery. Uh, it's a true story. Uh, and uh, if you know the history of lobotomy, uh, what I do, so I go to the, I go to the OR, and we, uh, the patient is not intubated. They're under light anesthesia, and we wake them up one, after the DBS electrodes are implanted. And, uh, uh, and then wake up. I, uh, I uh, instruct on, I do the behavioral testing, testing the different contacts at different amplitudes. Uh, so well, that's, what, that's what it's showing here. I, 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 you can adjust the, which contacts are selected, the amplitude, the frequency, and the pulse width. And, it can, and there, I think there's theoretically 40,000 uh, combinations. Uh, we try to keep that uh, limited to a s- small number. Anyway, going back to my role, so I, I'm in the OR, uh, and then most of my work is all post-op. It's doing the uh, programming of these patients. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to guess. It's probably I've programmed in excess of 50 patients now over the years and hundreds, probably thousands of hours of programming. And uh, it's been uh, an amazing experience, especially when it works. And it does work uh, many, most of the time. But uh, in my experience as a psychiatrist, there's been, been nothing like it in terms of uh, some of the immediate positive effects. You know, and I'll show you some videos to illustrate that. There are uh, newer leads out there. This is uh, so-called uh, directional leads that, that are segmented that allow you to steer the current in different directions. That's particularly useful if you're encountering side effects and, and you try to want to steer the field uh, away from that, that target. We, we actually published a case where uh, we started getting uh, metabolic side effects and attributed it to lateral health hypothalamic stimulation, steered it away from there, and the uh, uh, side effects went away. Uh, so that, that, that was a good uh, uh, illustration of the use of current steering. So uh, what, when doing the programming, it's like a, a Bluetooth-like uh, uh, interface. I've got a tablet. I'm doing the programming. This is an uh, illustration of the uh, ventral capsule for ventral striatum target. And this is the, these are the uh, leads that were actually uh, first approved by the FDA uh, for uh, OCD. Uh, and you can, they're really, the, the contacts are very widely spaced. In fact, you, there are four contacts. You can't even see the fourth one. It's way up there in the anterior limb in the internal capsule. What we found empirically over time, uh, and certainly in my experience, uh, you, you, you don't get uh, any behavioral response at two or three. So up, up the uh, capsule, don't see much, if any, behavioral response. And this very much mirrors the experience that the uh, Brown group has had with capsulotomy, in early work with gamma cut, uh, knife capsulotomy, showing that uh, need to move more ventral uh, uh, in order to see an effect. Uh, just, just quickly, this, this is the study that um, 
My, my first study with, uh, funded by NIMH to do DBS in this cohort of uh, six patients. We had four out of the six. It wasn't fully randomized. It, it, we, we did uh, a staggered onset so that everybody got implanted and the patient don't, didn't, and the, and the rater didn't know exactly when we would turn it on, but we didn't do a full parallel group design. And in fact, I, I don't think the field is ready for that. And I may talk about that later uh, because there's so much. Uh, optimization that has to occur on the individual level that I think it's really hard like to set it and forget it, at least for this uh, brain target for deep brain stimulation. And then we, we, we showed in this cohort, you know, we have four responders. Uh, years and years later, they were still responders. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the first patients, I think she's, I don't know, 19 years out now. <laughs> Uh, this is, uh, I, I mentioned this before, this is a, a meta-analysis that we published, uh, 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 combed the literature, found 255 uh, appropriate cases. Again, not just a ventral capsule, ventral striatum, but all the targets used for OCD, and overall the response rate came out to about 66%. This is, um, uh, this paper uh, uh, shows the, the very first patient that I, w I was ever involved with, with DBS at, uh, at the University of Florida. And um, we saw uh, something that uh, w was hard to believe at first. Uh, we, we saw what we now call a mirth response. So, and I'll show that in, in some videos, but we can see uh, either in the OR or, or the first programming session, it's not universal, but many times you'll see the induction of a, a smile and happiness. It's not, it, at first there were doubters saying that this is just motor. Uh, it's not just motor. There's definitely a motor component, but it's not motor alone. Uh, and what, what this slide is showing, so this is, she was, I just turned up at two volts on the left hemisphere. And this is the other thing, when we were watching this in real time, do you think it started on the right side first? And sure enough, when you go back through the video, it turns out that the smile starts contralateral to the side of the stimulation, but then spreads so quickly it's kind of hard to see. When, we, when we're in the OR, uh, uh, Samir Sheth and I, and we're looking at patients, what we, what we do is we get up really close and we look uh, to, to see if there's some movement on the contralateral side. Sometimes it's really subtle, but that gives us a, a clue that we're in the right spot. Okay, so this is a intra-op video of a patient, adult patient with OCD implanted at Bella College of Medicine. Do you feel any difference? What do you notice? What? Sad? Do you feel there? Okay. That feels okay? Yes. What does it feel like? Content. Hmm? Content. Content? How would you say your mood is? Okay. Good. Anxiety level? Hello. And energy? Compared to the way it was a little while ago. Um, a little bit better. Okay. How do you feel? Pretty good. What does it feel like? Feel like smiling? Yes. That does that feel better than just before? Or? Yes, it feels much better. Do you feel it physically, or is it? I feel it physically. Uh huh. What, My chest. What's it like? Can you describe it for us? Feel happiness compared to the way I've been feeling in the past month. Uh -huh. What do you feel in your chest? Just love. 
What do you feel? I'm sorry? Love. 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 Wow. Towards you or from you to others? From me to others. Uh-huh. It's been really hard to interact with my daughter. So we yeah. should make it easier. Yes. Good. That was a good reason for having the surgery, by the way. She went on to do very well. So she was in a, a study that I'll be describing soon, uh, and, she, and she was a responder. Um, in, in the, I just want to describe a little bit about the uh, surgical approach that Samir Shath has been, uh, colleagues have been taking at, at Baylor in the, in the last couple of years, um, in which, uh, since we haven't been sure, you know, wh wh uh, whether it's the ventral capsule ventral striatum that's the, the best target, which is uh, just interior to the anterior limb of the internal capsule, or another target in kind of in the same neighborhood. It's not in the BN, bed nucleus of terminalis, but above it, which is posterior uh, to the anterior commissure. And uh, we, we enough doubt that, and uh, in, in variability in patients, that uh, the, the neurosurgeons at, at our site plan out trajectories for both so that they're prepared to try either side. And then we, uh, uh, we so what this is showing here, it's maybe a little hard to see, but this, this is a patient that actually turned out, having, uh, in the end, having an asymmetric implantation. So on the uh, right hemisphere, uh, it's uh, behind the anterior commissure, so that's BNST, and here, anterior to the commissure, which is the ventral capsule ventral striatum. He, too, went, went on to do very well, but how did we come up with that uh, combination? Uh, we do the behavioral testing in, in the OR and then reported on uh, 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 in, in Journal of Neurosurgery on eight cases where we were taking this approach uh, in which we had to, uh, plotted out for both the uh, uh, VCVS and the BNST, look for the, the kind of positive valence effects that I, uh, that were shown in that pre, uh, prior patient, you know, looking for improvement in mood, energy, and reduction in anxiety, and wound up based upon the behavioral responses, some of which where either there was like nothing, there was no, you know it looked like there was no, pos no no positive signal, or in some cases something negative like anxiety, then moved to the other uh, target, and uh, uh, and then all in, in the end you know this needs a small a larger sample size, but in the end all eight of these patients uh, with this approach turned out to be responders, based upon the the adjudication of the uh, uh, behavioral response in the OR. I'd be remiss in not mentioning uh, that uh, there are other tar anatomic targets for DBS and OCD. Uh, one that's widely used in uh, parts of Europe uh, is anterior medial uh, subthalamic nucleus. It's not identical to the, uh, as I understand it, to the SDN target for Parkinson's disease. It's more uh, intermedial, more, more, I guess, called the kind of the limbic area. Uh, he's not, uh, nodding yes, so I feel good. Uh, <laughs> uh, and th this was a study, small sample, six patients uh, 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 by Taigi et al. And uh, th th they had a, a, a blinded counterbalance study where patients were either assigned to 12 weeks of one or the other in sequence, uh, compared the two, and then at the end, uh, in an open label fashion, combined both. Uh, and what, what they found is that there was no significant differences in uh, Y box scores or uh, OCD outcomes uh, with those two approaches, but there were some differences in some of the qualitative aspects of the response. In particular, uh, the VCVS uh, was better at uh, reducing symptoms of depression, and that's shown here on the uh, uh, Montgomery Asberg depression rating scale. Uh, now I'm going to talk. I guess I'm, I think I, I think I'm going to be on time. I hope. Uh, uh, the, there are limitations, of which I've already mentioned, about DBS, although we've gotten better in terms of our efficacy. It's still not perfect. It's still, even our responders maybe still have symptoms. And there's the uh, issue of hypomania. I'm going to skip those two slides. Uh, we made this argument about five years ago to the NIH Brain Initiative, and, and uh, we're fortunate to get uh, funded. 
uh, 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 where we, we did all the uh, implantation at Baylor. Uh, engineering uh, uh, was led by uh, uh, Dave Borden at Brown. And then uh, uh, talk about the role of uh, Cohen and Jenny at Pitt and, CM and Carnegie Mellon. And the, the goal was to try to develop a closed loop or adaptive DBS for OCD, which has been, uh, there's been a lot of progress on that front in movement disorders and, and including Tourette's. Yeah, so we, we thought that it'd be worthy to try to do the same for OCD. And even if we didn't get to the point of developing a, uh, uh, an effective closed loop system in the process, we would learn a lot about how to build classifiers for the different behavioral states uh, based upon, uh, because we, I, I didn't mention it yet, the devices we were using for this study at that time were research devices that not only stimulate but can also record. So now we had the opportunity to record LFPs from the ventral striatum in the flanking context where we were stimulating. So this gave us the opportunity to uh, try to uh, and we, we have done that successfully. I'll show you uh, this part of it. We haven't developed a closed loop system, but we have been successful at uh, time locking multiple streams of behavioral data with the neuro data in order to try to develop uh, classifiers for different behavioral states, specifically worsening in OCD, and then uh, the other being the uh, development of hypomania or mania. And this, uh, this is what the clinical trial designed for an individual patient. We've a uh, complete enrollment in the study. We're actually in our fifth year. Um, uh, we, all 10 patients were implanted. Uh, they had six months of open label uh, where I do, do the programming, try to optimize their programming. And then uh, they, they, even though they already had exposure response prevention in the past, we then added in the RFP because there was evidence that uh, th there's synergy between the two. So even though they failed it before, what we found in our study and others have found, uh, in particularly in the Amsterdam group, is that now they can uh, engage in the ERP and they start to habituate. They still get some of the anxiety effect, but the, uh, now the, the ERP is more effective and better tolerated than it was before the DBS. And then in order to demonstrate that this wasn't a sham effect, uh, we've we, we, uh, been conducting a uh, double-blind uh, taper of the DBS. We had 10 patients, I mentioned. Uh, the first five, our cortical signal was, was uh, scalp EEG. The second five uh, added an ECOG strip over the orbital frontal cortex bilaterally. So uh, we, we haven't been stimulating the OFC, but we've been recording in those five patients from the OFC. So now we have, uh, we can stimulate the, uh, through the DBS con uh, electrode leads, the ventral striatum, we can record from the ventral striatum, but we can now also record directly LFPs uh, from the cortex. And th th what this shows is uh, one of the things that FDA wanted to see uh, is to make sure that once those leads are in, they don't migrate. And you can, you, you can see that this is from two patients where uh, this before and after CTs and a month later, and, and they, 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 uh, the patients have done well with these ECOG strips chronically re, uh, implanted. So one, one of the issues I recognized in, in, in formulating uh, this grant is that um, we, we have lots of limitations when it comes to how we measure uh, um, symptoms of OCD or anxiety. Uh, uh, we, 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 our gold standards are like the Y box, a clinician rated instrument, or we, we can sometimes patients give self ratings. But that's not going to do it for when you're trying to uh, develop a classifier and time lock your neuro data with changes in, in mood and affect. So I looked for somebody who had developed uh, something that would allow me to accomplish this, and I found uh, Laszlo Jenny at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, L Laszlo, together with Jeff Cohn at Pittsburgh, developed the automated facial affect recognition system. And what he's demonstrating here is that the, the computer vision system uh, automatically identifies eyes, eyebrows, nose, and mouth, but it also superimposes a, uh, a virtual mesh on the face with a 1,000 points of contact. And what the, the program does is it measures the displacement from those individual points 
which then are uh, corresponding to the underlying facial muscles that uh, confer our different emotional states. And, and the literature of how, how you, you label affect and, and what muscles are involved goes back many, many years. Uh, but, and there are these 40 action units. So uh, this system can automatically identify uh, these action units. So it can do it in real time, and it does it quantitatively. And we can do this at the same time that we say changing TBS stimulation or doing an exposure with a patient, either in the clinic or at home. Uh, this is not a demonstration of that uh, the FR system, and this is uh, not not one of our patients. This is just some from uh, Pittsburgh, and you, you look at action unit uh, twelve, lip corner pullers, smiling, uh, and you can look to see when she smiles, and and let's. She should smile soon, and there it goes. There it goes. And then you, you can you know, you know, put these together. You know, you can, you, we, we decide to focus not on a particular single emotion or affect. We decide to uh, kind of a, 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 a transdiagnostic approach. We, we pick a positive or negative valence affect. So what we came up with a combination of action units that's either positive valence or negative valence. So it's a, uh, uh, and, and then uh, we we published the results of a, this was a, our first five patients, not a full ten, preliminary findings in Nature Medicine. Uh, Dave Borden and myself, uh, senior authors on this, and you know, Cole Prevenzer, who was a PhD student with uh, uh, Dave uh, here at Brown, uh, went on to do a postdoc with Samir Shath at Baylor, and she's now a, a, a faculty member. She's a Obviously, a, a, a engineering, a biomedical engineer, who's now faculty with us, uh, and uh, what we demonstrated in this in this paper uh, is the ability to uh, to be able to stream uh, neural data at the same time where we're looking at multiple uh, behavioral measures in different settings, whether in the clinic or at home, and captured over a thousand hours of LFPs at home. I'm going to skip this slide. Let me show you another video. So this one this is a programming session with a patient that was in our study. And what you're going to see here uh, is uh, the DBS is going to be off. I'm going to turn it up to 3 and a half volts. It's now all done current, constant current, but this was an older device. It's going to go off, and you get the picture. I'm going to go cycle it and, and ramp, ramp it up, and basically a dose-response curve for a behavior. And below are the LFP spectra. Uh, that we're recording at the same time. Programming. And, the, and uh, this is AFAR here, the automated facial that. affect recognition shown in this there. And oh, that's what this you, is. The blue, the blue is the AFAR. But by the clock when I I'm gonna pause do it, it change. Yeah. What is it like? It's just a like a, a buzzing in your chest, kind of. That's what it feels like. Like it's rumbling like a motor, but yeah, it's not. You know, I mean, it feels desirable. Yeah, it feels like I'm elated, like I'm awake. So it's a good feeling, like positive energy. The heart rate went up to him. Yeah. So that was three point five. I mean, it's mild, but it's definitely noticeable. You can tell. Mm -hmm. You can tell it right away. Yeah. It stops the vibration. So that so that the vibration's right in your chest. Yeah, but it's it's, it's hard to explain because I don't think like anyone else would be able to notice it except for me. You know, like it's. So you may be getting some vibration of the can. You know that one. Well, I don't see how to mitigate that. It's not disturbing or anything. Like sure. That. All right. Yeah. It's just like I notice it. The can being the pulse generator. Ready? Yeah, I feel that. That feels good. That feels a little bit more intense. It's like a warm, fuzzy feeling. Like it's good. Yeah, it's yeah. just good. Yeah. Like I feel like I could be more engaged in conversation than actually like enjoy it. So. Yeah. I like that. 
definitely is a little bit more intense than what you had on before, though. Now it's all. Yeah, that's good. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Does that feel more intense or more intense? More intense. More intense. 5.5. Yeah. I just feel like I got more energy. Like I'm ready to go. Pul pul pulse rate's up, but not any more than it was before. I think I'm um, acclimating to it, though. Yeah. He likes it. It's down, though. Yeah, I can tell right when it gets shut off. Yeah. It has like a two second delay when. So the, 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 he, he, he was our uh, first patient in the study I just described, and uh, he was a responder. He, he, he actually had rather low scores in depression compared to most of our other patients, had much higher scores. But let me, if you look at this green line, this, this is Y-box 1. Um, the, the, within four weeks, it uh, went down from 35 to uh, about a 20 uh, and continued to gradually get better, got even better after... A, a round of uh, booster of exposure response prevention. Uh, he uh, he, he uh, wound up, we had to rescue him during the uh, uh, discontinuation because he started to uh, get much more anxiety and depressive symptoms. Some of his OCD was coming back, reinstated it, and fortunately he stayed up on the same course and wound up uh, coming out with a, a Y box below 10, which we consider in remission. Uh, just to show that what we've also been able to do, and this, this has been really cool, this was particularly during the pandemic, we were able to uh, do uh, virtual ERP uh, into a patient's home uh, with the device, and uh, although uh, we couldn't, didn't use the AFAR system, it's a little bit hard to do it at home, uh, he did give uh, subjective units of distress, subjective ratings, and we were able to uh, capture uh, NOR recordings as well. I'll skip that. So let me show you uh, one more video. Uh, th this is a, uh, another patient uh, and uh, who, who's uh, in the in the uh, Nature Medicine uh, article, uh, and it shows here the uh, uh, FR system, positive affect, head velocity. Oh, the other thing I'm going to mention too is one of the things that uh, we actually think is a more reliable measure of uh, increase uh, in mood and energy. Uh, is talkativeness. So we're, we're, we're looking at speech because you, you get this kind of mirth response early on, but you're not going to sit there smiling and laughing, right? That's going to be more momentary. But the talkativeness, so we've, we've been doing uh, experiments where the patient is blind to the DBS settings in the clinic. We may run it at the uh, a higher or the normal level, and then at some point either turn it off or go to a lower level, and then we track... Uh, more than looking at the aff the affect is still important, uh, but the, the speech actually becomes a, a, a better readout of their change in behavior. Uh, we have heart rate, scalp EEG, DBS amplitude. Now watch the DBS amplitude when I turn on the uh, 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 video. And we have uh, some local field potentials in an accelerometer that's on the device. See the DBS is ramping up. Weird. <laughs> you guys are shaking my body. It's odd. Back to where we were. Okay, it's not shaking. How weird. <laughs> it would literally, when you turned it off, I didn't even realize that it went back to doing this on it. I didn't even know it was doing that. Yeah. It's not doing that right now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's like the best thing ever. That it's, that's cool. Cool. Weird. <laughs> it's not, like I'm not internally trembling, like fear-wise. Oh. <laughs> different. That's probably 
probably the biggest thing I can feel different is there's not like a, other than just feeling like a breeze feeling, but other than that, those are the two Why things. Why are you feeling Because it feels nice that I'm not shaking and I didn't even know I was shaking. <laughs> like it feels, it's a good thing, like I didn't realize it until you turned it off and it like, my stomach inside felt like it was doing this. And I was like, oh, am I more anxious again? Like why is that? Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, guys, this is so freaking cool. <laughs> yeah. So uh, th this is her outcome data. She's uh, one of our stars. She's actually uh, 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 spoken at some public events. She's wanted to kind of share her experience with others. She's a wonderful person. And uh, she had very significant depression at baseline. And here you can see the... Uh, although there was some improvement early on in the OCD, it's not that, that great. Most of the early improvement, as you might expect, is in depression, depressive scores. Uh, you can see that this is the uh, depression scores coming down. And the improvement of OCD was much more gradual. Again, she, she did very well during the behavior therapy. And then uh, we, we had to, uh, we, she, she didn't make it too far within the discontinuation and ended up. Uh, with a Y box uh, uh, of about 12, which again is really good. I'm gonna skip these other ones. Oh, one, I do have to show one. This one uh, in all being full transparency. Uh, this is one of our patients that was in the trial that had two manic episodes, two, two, so two SAEs. Uh, and, and this is despite the fact that I've gotten pretty good at uh, uh, tapering, you know, uh, gr gradually titrating the, uh, uh, the therapy, but it, it can still happen. Uh, and uh, it, it took a while to get him back on track, uh, but eventually did. And again, uh, he, he wound up doing well uh, by the end. But uh, uh, it, it, there were some scary moments because he, he, uh, he, he became manic. He got caught up in a catfishing scam. Uh, uh, one of the things I, I didn't mention is that one of the things that increases the, the DBS and, and the, is, along with uh, mood is sometimes libido. So uh, that, that got him into some uh, serious trouble, especially as he became manic. Let's skip that. Okay. Uh, in terms of the clinical outcomes so far in the, the study, uh, we have eight out of the 10 responders before exposure response prevention, nine out of 10 responders after ERP. All of them had to be rescued during, uh, during the discontinuation and have uh, DBS reinstated. Uh, the, uh, there were five men, five women, between the ages of 21 and 55, and, and here showing some of the Y box scores. And I didn't calculate what the mean reduction is, but it's, it is significant. So I think this is my last slide, except my acknowledgments. Uh, so uh, building LFPs uh, based on classifiers or, or in psychiatric disorders are challenging because most of our measures are subjective and not on the same time scales nor recordings. So I think this is where uh, the computer machine, vision machine learning comes in uh, uh, handy, particularly useful as a label for those changing mood states. I mentioned about talkativeness uh, as something that emerged from our findings as a, as a measure of behavioral outcome. Uh, and where, let me get rid of this reminder. Uh, and we're still in the process. We've accumulated uh, tons of uh, uh, neuro and behavioral data and still working our way through it. I uh, want to thank uh, first the team at Baylor, Samir Sheth, our uh, DBS neurosurgeon, Eric Storch, our uh, vice chair for psychology, Nicole Primenza, who I mentioned uh, just a, a little while ago, uh, and uh, then our collaborators at, at, at Brown, uh, uh, University of Washington, Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon. And finally, I uh, want to thank the NIH for their support, Medtronic for donating the devices. Uh, and thank you for your attention. I have time for questions, right? demonstrated a difference in a, you, a lot of the uh, visuals that you showed were querying affect it seemed <clears throat> did you get a differential between the obsessive thoughts and the compulsive behaviors with your stimulation so uh, for, for the for uh, 
early on, and, and, and Steve and, and, and Ben were here, he could, he could mention this too, when, when started doing even the intraoperative behavioral testing, you know, asked about mood, energy, anxiety, but also OCD symptoms, I found that that, uh, particularly in the OR, uh, patients uh, have a lot of other things on their mind. Uh, 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 so we, we stopped assessing OCD symptoms. And even in the early programming, and I think this is re really uh, hard to your question, d don't see a lot of impact in the OCD in most cases. You, you do start, in some patients, and it could occur, I guess, in the first programming session, but not, not typically. Early on in programming, you, patients may say that their intrusive thoughts are not bothering them as much. And because they're not bothering them as much, they don't feel the same need to give into their compulsions. That's about like the earliest sign I, I would see of changes in OCD. But in most cases, particularly the ones with very severe depression, the improvement's first in depression and, and, and affect and mood, and not in OCD. Oh, he's, he's handing out the mic. He, I'm agnostic. Just a, oh, sorry, just a quick follow-up to that question. So would you say then that it's really increasing patients' flexibility to respond to subsequent ERPs? Is that sort of like what the mechanism is of the deep brain stimulation? I wouldn't say, no, I mean, that's a clue. You know, I think, I think what, 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 the, what the, the ability to tolerate and get better during the ERP probably does say something about uh, their reactivity to the triggers. My, my own theory, uh, you know, I guess I can share it with this audience, is that most patients with uh, OCD are harm avoidant. You know, they're worried about something happening to themselves or being responsible for something bad happening to someone else. And I think what we're doing with VCVS is we're changing circuit balance from kind of this harm avoidant state to more of a hedonic state where uh, reward matters more than avoiding harm. Uh, that's at least my way of trying to conceptualize what I think happens. I don't know, I'd be interested in what others think. I have a question. By the way, this is fascinating. I can feel my chest buzzing as well. <laughs> uh, so I come from slice electrophysiology, and uh, I know by fact that uh, different types of interneurons express different types of uh, sensitivity to different patterns of stimulation. So for instance, if you look at uh, GABAergic interneurons that target the soma of other neurons, their synapse is uh, shut down by high-frequency stimuli. However, interneurons that target the dendrites of other neurons uh, tends to light up when uh, you stimulate their synapse. So there's a basis for like finding f frequencies, specific frequencies. Say that one more time. Say that last part one more time. Yeah, so, I'm also hard of hearing. So, so different type of, of uh, different synapses from different type of neurons express different frequency dependencies in terms of short-term plasticity, as, at least. And this is just one of the parameters that express se uh, sensitivity to different uh, stimulation patterns. So ideally, you could find, for instance, a frequency that can shut up, uh, sh shut down one uh, type of synapse, but activate the other type. And it is just speaking of short-term plasticity. So do, you, do, you, do you have a, a theory about what, so the, the, the range in, in DBS, the frequency range, that seems to be therapeutic, for this indication, I think, for what we know about depression as well, is somewhere between 100 and 150 hertz. Based upon your, you're not, what would you predict about what the net it's, effect would I be? I think you could find different scenarios with just using that frequency. That's a frequency that could completely depress some synapse, uh, but uh, activate other ones. Yeah. And just speaking of the, of the synapses themselves. So I was wondering, what is your thinking in terms of finding the right frequency that works given the, 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 the net result that yeah. you try to achieve in the circuits that you target? So, so we, we don't do a lot to adjust frequency. I, mean, I, I, I said that we can, uh, but, uh, but we, we generally start out somewhere like 130 hertz. Uh, and we have tested, and even in the study, we, 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 uh, we, we've tested different frequencies. And once you start going below 100 hertz, you don't see as robust a therapeutic effect you start losing it. I, I recently had a patient that was implanted somewhere else years ago, and they set uh, the frequency at 70 hertz, uh, and he, it didn't work. <laughs> you, you know, uh, and I turned it up to 130, and all of a sudden he lit up. 
So I, I don't know how to reconcile uh, that data. I, I guess, I, I don't know, I, I hate to put you on the spot, but, uh, well, uh, I mean, there, there is this other theory out there that although you can't propagate uh, an action potential across a synapse at that kind of frequency, you can get antidromic uh, propagation, and it may be that that then is leading through interneurons that, to your net effect. I mean, does that make any sense to you? <laughs> Um, how do you see the new ultrasound technology and the non-invasive DBS um, kind of model changing the field and also um, potentially making uh, this more accessible? Yeah, well, uh, um, I think I, I mentioned it at the beginning. We are in, in the process of conducting a, a study together with Mass General Hospital of LIFU targeting the same brain area, uh, non-invasively with uh, LIFU. Uh, we, we first did a healthy subject study, which is now in press, uh, accepted, it's not in press, uh, and in which we, we've been exploring the parameter space. I think one of the challenges, and I think maybe no, Noah and I can agree, agree on this, we spoke about it at breakfast, is there's a huge parameter space out there uh, that's really, we really don't, although we're talking about with DBS, we've kind of figured out what the right frequency band is, but we, we don't know a lot about what's the, the right uh, uh, pulse repetition frequency, the right uh, pulse width uh, in, for LIFO, but the potential is enormous uh, because of the, the ability to reach these deep, deep structures focally. I think theoretically, uh, one to two millimeters if you have a multi-array multi uh, system. Um, given all the positive data oh, over here, <laughs> given all the positive data um, on DBS for OCD over the past 20 years, um, what do you think will, do you think there will ever be a time where it gets full uh, FDA approval and it becomes main, utilized in the mainstream, um, and what will it take to get there? I don't, I don't think it's going to get uh, full approval. Uh, that, that would require a very large and expensive study, and I, I don't see anybody coming forth to do that. So I, I think the best we can hope for is that it, that it stays uh, available under the HDE. So for the patients who show hypomania, are there any patterns that emerge, for example, any of their pre-existing conditions or medications or even the level of um, frequency at which that shows up? Yeah, so um, you know, and when I look back, like on the, on the case that I showed, showed the, I said that we had somebody had two manic episodes. Now, it's easier that, then in retrospect, say, so, well, maybe he had an underlying bipolar diathesis. But in fact, he, he, he never had a manic episode or even hypomanic episode before. What the, the, the manifestations of the, when you do a hypomanic or manic episode with DBS, and, and presumably in somebody who never had it before, it looks exactly the same as mania. We had a, 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 a patient just a, a few months ago uh, in the office in the first programming session. He, although he wouldn't meet criteria, duration criteria, he was manic. He was dancing up and down. He was happy. He, he, his OCD was gone. He said he was ready to do everything. I had to turn him down. <laughs> I, I guess my question is more, can you discern risk factors at some point to be able to tell with the larger yeah. population? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're hoping to do a study in bipolar depression, so we may get the answer there. But I think you know, hist obviously, you know, history of bipolar, you know, with with the uh, consideration, either one or two. Oh, hello, I'm Megan. Um, so I'm really interested in this idea of different etiologies of OCD. Um, so, like for instance, as you were talking about, kind of as if people have like a later onset of OCD. Um, perhaps we can think about different etiologies to that. Um, and I was kind of wondering if you saw any like specific um, either subtypes or symptom clusters that were more likely to respond to DBS than others? So uh, with respect to the 
DBS, I mean, it's a little, a little hard to answer the question about subtypes and, and predicting a response, partly because we tend to exclude some patients. So we, we, for, one, for example, we exclude patients that are primarily have hoarding. They may have, you know, it's okay for them to have some hoarding as part of their OCD, but we exclude them. Uh, I, I, have, I have this, uh, so this may be a, uh, worth mentioning, so I said that nine out of our 10 or eight out of our 10 patients are responders in, the, in this trial. The one patient is the last patient, who so far is not a responder, uh, has contamination OCD, but he, has a, he, he doesn't have harm avoidance. He is disgust. I've always made this distinction back, we made this distinction back on the Y box that m most patients with contamination OCD worry about consequences. Either they're going to get sick or they give somebody else an illness, but there's a subset where it's just yucky. And, and really, and they'll even make the face of disgust. I think it's a, I mean, it's a, a, a different emotional response. They're not worried about bad things happening. They just don't like the feel of it or the thought of it. And he has not responded. So we just got approval. Since, you know, he, he has the uh, ECOG strip, which we've only used for recording. We just got approval from the FDA to stimulate through the OFC in this case to see whether that can convert him to a responder. Would that be kind of, just like a follow-up, would that be kind of the same for like just right OCD? Do you see benefits with DBS with those patients? Yeah, um, I, I've seen, seen the just, I think the just right do fine. I don't know, Steve, I don't know if you had a thought on that too or with, with uh, capsulotomy. But yeah, I, 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 I guess I, I wouldn't hesitate uh, if somebody had perfectionistic or uh, uh, just right phenomena if they met the other criteria. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm over here. Um, I was just curious that all of the patients, I know it's a small specified sample, they all had that rescue experience. Um, and I was wondering if that was related or if you have any thoughts about if that's gonna extend the programming you need to have or if it maybe was more representative of like a habituation to the hedonistic feelings. I just wanted to hear a little bit more about your yeah. thoughts on so, that so, rescue. Um, we, we, we tried to do, we didn't do it extremely gradual. We, we, what we do, we do it a double blind fashion. So the raider's blind, the patient's blind. We, we let them know when it starts, when they're entering that phase. The first session is sham. We don't lower it. And one of the problems with that design is the nocebo effect. It's massive. Uh, so uh, even though we tell patients we, it may not be turning it off, uh, it, most of the patients begin to feel worse, even though I haven't changed anything. So we kind of nurse them through that. And then on the, a week later, we, we reduce it by 50%, and, and, and that was probably too much. Most patients will relapse when you cut it by 50%. And by say relapse, that's probably too strong a word, uh, because some of them, it, it may be uh, emergence or even uh, uh, rebound of anxiety and depressive symptoms. It's more the anxiety and depression than the OCD that gets them reinstated. Now, I do have one, one patient, I, I had it in a slide, we uh, doing in clinic, 50% reduction. Within 10 minutes, she started crying and said that she was having intrusive thoughts that she was gonna harm a child, which was what she hadn't had for months. So, and, and so that was the end of it. I wasn't gonna put her through that, so we reinstated it and she, was, she recovered like in, in two hours. Hi, um, I was wondering what kind of monitoring will be necessary for these patients for the rest of their lives? Uh, well, presumably they're, they're, respond, they're presumably they're responders. Uh, it's probably, patients do ask me that, family members, and I, I would think it's probably lifelong. I mean, the, the way, uh, I've had patients certainly that wanted to turn it off, uh, have, have it explanted, and you can, it can be explanted, the system can be explanted. Uh, but in all those cases, I've said, let's turn it off first and see what happens. In a lot of cases, even patients that didn't think it was helping, once you turn it off, uh, particularly depressive symptoms start returning. And I say, well, maybe, maybe I should leave it on and leave it in. But uh, th th yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna need a follow-up in expert hands, that's for sure. The nice thing, that the current uh, patients that we're implanting now after the study, there's now a rechargeable, I didn't mention this, but the, the device that we were using for record, a research device for recording was rechargeable, which was very important because we don't wanna drink, we, 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 we're, uh, we're doing all those recordings, all that stimulation. They want to drain a, a primary cell. Uh, and now there's a rechargeable, a commercially available rechargeable uh, device available on the market. 
They can also record. I have a question up here. I'm just curious, multiple people had- Where, where are you? Oh, I'm over here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, mul multiple of the participants had mentioned having this sensation in their chests, and I'm wondering, you know, other somatic symptoms that may somehow be concordant with the mood changes. If you have any thoughts yeah, about what that I, is, I, I, I've been very impressed with uh, the somatic uh, aspects of their their uh, experience. I mean, we all learn, we all know about that. We've all experienced it ourselves. But in, in many patients, it's just like she described it. It's it's a very physical feeling. It's very visceral. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the other one where he said, I can feel that, that in, in my chest, I, I worried that it was the monopolar stimulation was causing paresthesias of the uh, IPG. It turned out that wasn't the case. He was just describing the feeling in his chest. Of, uh, and then it, it actually felt good, not bad to him. Thank you. Along the same lines, right here. Um, great segue, and almost the same, but a little different. From a neurophilosophical perspective, which we haven't had yet until your question, what is an emotion? And so the idea of stimulating a specific portion of the brain, but then having a visceral or some type of a somatic response with the cognition associated with it, I feel warm fuzzies, was one yeah. of the statements. Thanks for clarifying about it was not simply a buzzing, a physical no. No, turned, a mechanical I receptor. It was, but it wasn't. So what is an emotion based on what you're showing here? Uh, he was happy. <laughs> and, uh, and the other one, I mean, the one in the OR, she felt love in her chest. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> right. So, the, I mean, the other thing that changes, and this may have to do why, why they, they, they're, they, their OCD gets better or why they do better with ERP, is they, their, their interactions with people. They, they become more talkative, hopefully not too talkative, to the point of pressured speech, which, uh, but uh, they, they feel like engaging more with people. Uh, and, and so there's a real change in, uh, in their behavior, uh, social behavior. One of my mentors has said, Kurt, realize that motion, it, emotion is six-sevenths motion. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. Hi, uh, up here. I'm Wave, okay. Uh, hello. Uh, so I, I think it's really curious, and I'm sure uh, you and your colleagues have you know, sort of talked about this, that you have this sort of immediate effect for depression, and then a, it takes a little bit longer for OCD effects to kick in. But it seems like when the device is turned off, uh, symptoms return pretty quickly. Mm. So that dynamic, does that inform sort of the effects that are being had on the actual circuits, whether there's some circuits that are stronger than others, or what, what is, I don't, especially I, the CSTC? Sure, I'm not sure how to answer that part of the question, but uh, what, what, what I would say is it doesn't look like there are neuroplastic Changes. It, 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 when, once you, it, 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 even with the patients that have, this is uh, interesting. The ones they've even had the ERP on top of it. Now they've gotten even better. All right, you turn off the DBS and their OCD go, uh, starts to go back to the way it was. Uh, so that uh, whatever changes that seem to be affected by the DBS stimulation uh, don't seem to be enduring. It's not like I guess it's not like TMS where you can see ongoing effects. You don't see it with DBS, at least in, in, in my experience. Hi. Wave. <laughs> there you go. Um, I was also interested in the underlying um, etiology of, and the differences across subtypes. And so you answered that question a second ago, but I was curious now, a follow-up. You mentioned how disgust didn't seem to be targeted. So I was curious if you have thoughts on what um, that tells us about diagnostics or differentials or etiology about OCD as like a phenomenon. Is that, what do you think of that? Um, why isn't that being targeted given that it seems disgust is a large part of what we now know is like an OCD criteria, but maybe you have thoughts on differentials. Um, I, I, I was going back a number of years, uh, I, I was very interested in the, in the role of disgust uh, published some uh, functional imaging studies uh, comparing healthy subjects to uh, patients with OCD and two different types of contamination using the IAPS, you know, uh, Peter Lang's pictures. And uh, it, we, we saw a lot of insula activity uh, with disgust, more so in the OCD patients compared to healthy subjects uh, controlling for disgust sensitivity. Because you don't have to have, you can have high disgust sensitivity without having OCD, right? Uh, but 
I, I was never able to get anything funded in that domain. <laughs> Uh, it, it was. Uh, I'd heard that review sec the reviewers would laugh <laughs> when we talked about disgust. So it, it's it's pretty much. So I, I, and it's just not taken seriously. Although from from and I haven't returned to that literature in a very long time. But my uh, understanding of it is there the circuitry is probably different. I I I really it, it may feed into the, some of the same circuits we described in OCD. But there are also some uh, key differences. It's more interoceptive. And that's maybe why you were asking about the just right. I think the question is really, do the interoceptive types of OCD uh, respond less robustly? Uh, you know, and, anyway. Okay. Hi, I'm over here. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Um, I'm curious about the kind of operation side effects aside from the mania, are there any lesions or damage to other brain areas or any other concerns you've seen in terms of safety? So, so again, I, uh, make sure you correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the, uh, we have a neurosurgeon, uh, functional neurosurgeon sitting right there. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, I think that the, m most, uh, the most dreaded effect is, is a hematoma. Uh, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I think that's, it's rare. Uh, I, I, the, you know, the, the neurosurgeons spend a lot of time uh, making sure their trajectory avoids any, any large vessels. Uh, I, I certainly have not seen it. Uh, uh, there, there's the, the risk of infection, which is more common. Uh, had I remember one case where, you know, it became, uh, uh, I mean, most of the time you could, you could treat that. You just worry about it getting into the brain, obviously, and seizures. But again, all those are relatively small. It, it, I mean, there are, what, 200,000 cases worldwide of DBS for movement disorders? I mean, to uh, neurosurgeons, uh, this is a very routine uh, experience. So it's not without risk. It's certainly invasive, uh, but it, it's... Uh, it can even be called minimally invasive to some degree because of the safety record. Yep, sorry. So uh, my question is, when it comes to patients who don't have access to neurosurgical interventions, let's say a battery dies and they're in remote areas, what are their options when it comes to staying safe um, in face of device malfunction, et cetera? Oh, yeah. So uh, that was definitely a concern during the study I was describing because... You, uh, uh, you would have to come to Houston uh, to, for that. Uh, but now with the commercial devices, I mean, the, the, uh, uh, you can find rep, you know, industry representatives uh, around the globe. Uh, and, and we've had that. You know, different pe we have people from different parts of the country. And if somebody runs into a hardware problem or the recharger isn't working, uh, we, we can usually within a, a day or two uh, get them a replacement. And the good thing is that the re with the rechargeable, uh, unless the, the, there's a problem with the recharger or the patient fails to recharge it, you don't have to worry about it uh, running out. Okay, well, thank you so thank much, you. Dr. Goodman, for a wonderful talk.